I am, uh, again, Uri Bebe, I'm Professor of History, Merhuni Family Presidential Chair, Chair in Armenian Studies and the Director of the Center for Armenian Studies. And on behalf of the Center and all our co-sponsors, and with all sincerity, I recognize our presence on the ancestral and unceded homeland of the Tongva and Hashiman peoples. Uh, this evening's event is made possible by the initiative and effort of the UCI Armenian Student Association uh, with the support of the Center for Armenian Studies and in collaboration with the Department of Global and International Studies. Uh, I'm sorry to say tomorrow's research presentations have been postponed to April 3, 2024 to ensure full attendance. Uh, we thought two in a row might be a bit much. Um, and we don't want you to miss the research presentations of our graduate students. Now, before I introduce our speaker, uh, I'd like to invite, um, is that how we're doing it? Yes. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Angela de Madirosian uh, from uh, ASA, Armenian Student Association, to say a few words on ASA's behalf. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, this lecture is part of a greater campaign that all Armenian student associations are doing across the country to help raise awareness for uh, what has been happening in Artsakh, otherwise known as nagorno karabakh uh, We've dedicated the month of November to Artsakh Awareness Month, and uh, this has been an initiative of fundraisers, lectures, film screenings that uh, are dedicated to helping and amplifying the voices of the Armenians of Artsakh. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, I've actually been working closely with Angela this quarter, and um, I have to say she has a bright future, and we're very lucky uh, to have her. So uh, now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, it's my great honor uh, to introduce you to uh, Luis Moreno Campo, who has so graciously agreed to speak to us and with us today. Luis Moreno Ocampo served as the first prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, ICC, from 2003 to 2012. The ICC is an intergovernmental organization and international tribunal uh, at The Hague. It is the first and only permanent international court with jurisdiction to prosecute individuals for the international crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and others, other such uh, crimes. Uh, under his mandate, the Office of the Prosecutor opened investigations in several countries successfully, prosecuting three heads of state, including Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir, for crimes against humanity. Before his presidency of ICC, Moreno Ocampo played a major role in Argentina's democratic transition. As Deputy Prosecutor of the Trial of the Juntas, he helped try those most responsible for the Argentine military dictatorship between 76 and 83, and gave a voice and a face to its victims. Moreno Campo has been a visiting professor or fellow at several universities, including USC, uh, Yale, Harvard, and NYU. He has acted as a consultant to the World Bank, uh, the United Nations, and other organizations. Moreno Campo received the Legion of Honor of France and was distinguished in, in 2011 as one of 100 global thinkers by the publication Foreign Policy. The Atlantic included him among its brave thinkers. In August 2023, Moreno Campo published a report saying that the government of Azerbaijan had committed genocide in its blockade of Armenians in Artsakh nagorno karabakh Please give him a warm welcome. Um, thank you very much for this work. Um, when I was prosecutor, I was involved in one genocide case who was against President Bashir from Sudan. And I was thinking, okay, that's it. That is the, the last genocide in the world. And uh, I've been so disappointed because since September, so in the last two months, the UN advisor on genocide prevention identified five genocides in the world. Five, no one, five. 
including Nagar Makarava, <coughs> including Darfur, who is going there for the last 20 years, including Rohingya in Myanmar, including Tigray in, in Ethiopia. If you believe no one talk about Nagorno Karabakh, who talk about Ethiopia in Tigray? No one. And then you have a, a genocide committed by Hamas in Israel, and probably a genocide against the Palestinians in Gaza. So, uh, and then when Angela called me, asking me to come to discuss this issue, and I said, I live in Malibu, so it's, at this time it takes two hours to come. I said, look, it's a long trip. You have to pay me. You have to give me 20 TikToks. You have to interview families and ask them if they believe what happened in nagorno karabakh this year is also genocide comparable or acceptable is a genocide like was a genocide in 1915. and she said okay last weekend i called her we talked about preparing this meeting i said look if you have 10 tiktok would be fine summarize them and she said well i told you 20. Uh, so, uh, I like ask her because I was thinking, I will tell you why it's so important to say it's a genocide. Uh, I will say why it's, it's important to the protection of the nagorno karabakh people and for the protection of the Armenians. But some people were telling me, when I complain in some Armenian communities, why you're not mention genocide, some of them get me this idea, okay, there are many Armenians that believe, well, no, the real genocide was 1915. Now, it's not genocide, it's different. You, you cannot compare. But, and she, she did, they, can you show them? Okay, she did a, her job. <laughs> she paid me. <laughs> okay, maybe you can reduce the light. I would like to add that we interviewed regular Armenian families, our students interviewed their parents, their grandparents. And uh, that these are that these are descendants of Armenian genocide survivors, and these are this is their opinion. So all these are Armenian families. Yes. Okay. Yes, I think it was. I will say yes. 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 It was a genocide. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Is it a form of genocide? Um, and it was a genocide? Artsakh, genocide. You don't hear the news talking about this. More than a million Armenians perished in the 1915 Armenian genocide through death marches, massacres, starvation, and disease. It was a complete existential threat to the Armenian identity and an assault on their Armenian culture. So now we come to Artsakh a land historically inhabited by Armenians. This was another assault on Armenian identity and culture. Armenians ran away from that area after capture because we know what the country of Azerbaijan will do, and there is a lack of trust of being under their rule, just like the Ottoman Turks. There is also an erasure of Armenian historical places like Amaras Monastery, relabeling historical sites like this as Caucasian Albania, and denying that Armenians lived there for hundreds and hundreds of years, destroying cemeteries, using a fake narrative to diminish and demean a culture of Armenians, is a form of genocide. You have a population of like 15,000 people that are cut off from their access to food, to uh, electricity, to internet, to medicines. This was a directed attempt to basically start out the population. These were efforts um, aimed at a specific group of people in an attempt to a, kill some of the people and to 
give them tastes of freedom. Sometimes they would turn on the water or turn on the electricity rather, and then turn it off just to basically psychologically break down this entire population so that whenever they eventually carried out their military operation, they gave a very clear message to the people, which is, if you stay, we will make sure that either A, your lives will be unlivable, or B, we will come and we will kill you. This message kept being uh, driven home by the government of Azerbaijan and by the actions of Azerbaijan on the population of the people of the Azov, who were exclusively Armenian. Uh, when you were told that you have three days before Azeris come, and then you were told you have half an hour and to leave your home and land where you have, you buried all your ancestors there, all your families there. And now you have half an hour and you have to exit and leave everything behind your ancestral land, land where you lived for thousands of years, just because you are Armenian, just because neighboring state claims you as their own, because you know if you stay, you will be butchered. But that's what they learned at school, that there are villain people, that those people are called Armenians, and the history that they learn is not real history. Those are facts that they just fabricated and taught at school. They raised a generation in hatred culture. In September of 2023, after a nine-month of blockade and severe starvation, over 100,000 indigenous Armenians of Artsakh were attacked by Azerbaijan, resulting in killings and forced displacement from their homes. Azerbaijan started destroying ancient Armenian churches and other historical heritage of great importance, thus trying to get rid of any evidence of Armenian ethnic groups ever existing in the region of Arta. The dictatorship regime of Azerbaijan has perpetrated and committed genocide once again in 2023 against peaceful people of Artsakh. They bombed the Artsakh civilians, they invaded their houses. All these actions were well documented. People of Artsakh were denied their fundamental rights of self-determination and their fundamental right to live in peace. So Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh, from Artsakh, were cleansed and forced to flee their homeland. They were cut out from the uh, supplies of food. This is considered as a genocide. Genocide and doesn't need a killing. Killing can happen, which were happening and was happening during this period of time, but it's not the only thing that is considered as genocide. The unbearable living conditions that were made for Armenians in Karabakh without electricity, without gas, without running water, without regular medication or food, it is a genocide. In the history, the uh, enforced migration was practiced by the Ottoman Empire. And uh, let's not forget that you know, Azerbaijan and Turkey or the Ottoman people, they are the same people. Even they say that they are same people with two different countries. So it is the same same uh, ideology. This uh, enforced migration, which is in Turkish Sürgün, was practiced during the centuries. Even going back to the 17th century, they used to do that during the Sultan's time. And uh, during the dislocations, this enforced uh, migrations, uh, violent means were employed to get rid of the subjected people who were either uh, you know, religiously different from them or uh, racially different from them. So uh, coming back to the present time, same thing happened. It was enforced migration. They made it so that the people had to live at the end. With the blockade, uh, blockaded people didn't have the food, they didn't have much medication, they didn't have uh, any help from the outside world, and they had to, they had to uh, migrate eventually. This is a genocide. You don't have to kill the person. You don't have to kill a whole population to call it genocide. You can, you can kill their. Uh, Emotionally, you can kill them uh, mentally. You can kill their uh, their willingness to 
to live and uh, make them to move. Because of their um, ethnicity, and a lot of people died during that exhaustive multi day trip to Armenia, relocation to Armenia. People were scared, you know, after all that mentioned, um, there was oppression, even against their own people. So the religion is one of the last countries when there is democracy and then turns to democracy. A lot of journalists, if they express a humble concern or opinion against a uh, ruling regime. They're put to jail, they're oppressed, they're beat up. And speaking of their own people, now we talk about the Armenians when they had um, decades of hatred and uh, cultivated hatred in schools. And it's absolutely, absolutely impractical to think that they will be living this living this in another another started in 1915 with the Red Genocide. Let's go on to the White Genocide where our history is being whitewashed. Back to Pogrom starting in 88. And uh, our Atsakh wanting its independence, saying no future as part of Azerbaijan during the fall of the Soviet Union. Finally have independence and here we are again with more genocide, more ethnic cleansing. Where are the Armenians now? Atsakh was 98, 98% Armenian. They successfully wiped out everybody. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, starved the entire Armenian population by locating the area to show the civilian population. And uh, lastly, they forced the remaining Armenian population out of their homeland, out of their country. Now they are destroying the ancient sites and uh, the Armenian church is trying to erase the whole history of the nation. If this is not genocide, what else is it? There was killings of a specific group, uh, causing physical and mental harm to such group, deliberately bringing destruction to the group and whole and apart. You could think of it as a genocide against Artsakh Armenians or against Armenians in general. Um, it, you know, prevents um, the force, it prevents children from being transferred peacefully. Uh, in some cases, the intent is to absorb the children and take them away from their families. And those children would have been forced into Azeri society and lose their heritage and culture. Um, there was ethnic targeting, so specific targeting of Aksak Armenians. A uh, nine month, 10 month blockade was forced displacement created a forced removal once the military action started. Uh, it also has historical echoes, which for Armenians as an as existential threat based on our ethnicity. When your motherland was bombed, when you were killed because you were Armenian, it's called genocide. When you're forced to leave your land, leaving everything, your home, and by staying there you will be killed, it's called genocide. When, because of the aggressive action, the state as the Artsakh, separate state as Artsakh, is stuck in this existence, economy, culture, language, everything was stuck. It was genocide. And when Azerbaijan started destroying everything, destroying historical monuments, churches, it's called genocide. <laughs> So, as you saw in the in the research that Angela did, there was no one talking that it's not genocide. Everyone, so I don't know if it's bias or, or what, but there was no one. So I asked Angela, Angela, can you look for some TikTok talking that it's not genocide? And she found something, but not the specific Armenian, no? Can you show them? Yeah. But what you did, you tried to find Armenians saying it's not yes. genocide. So I tried to find Armenians who would claim that this is not a genocide, and I found none. I found two who were unwilling to present their opinion, and other than that, there were there was nobody who held this view. Um, but we did find non-Armenians and some of their other beliefs. I'm going to read. 
Uh, this is a tweet. Uh, not sure if you guys are following Azerbaijan's supposed, supposed genocide in Karabakh, but according to CNN and the New York Times, so far 90%, 95% of deaths were military. Uh, name a single country engaged, uh, engaging militants in urban areas with a lower military to civilian death ratio. Name one. While each civilian life is sacred, if 10 deaths is considered a genocide, then technically there are six genocides taking place in Chicago. Uh, over any given weekend. You can't just throw around genocide every time you're displeased with the outcome of military operation. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, there was no genocide. This is the official statement of the UN Commission, which did not find a single destroyed civilian object in Karabakh, nor a single death or wounded Armenian. The Armenian separatists left voluntarily because they did not want to accept Azerbaijani citizens. Um, where, where do people get your info? Azerbaijan did not expel Armenians, they did the opposite. They recommended Armenians to stay. The Armenians chose voluntary exodus out of precaution, and now Azerbaijan says Kharabakh Armenians are welcome to return whenever they choose. And finally, Azerbaijan has the right to use force and take control of the separatist region. The President Aliyev offered citizenship to Armenians, reintegration into Azerbaijan, amnesty, open roads for all essential goods, and talks in Baku. Armenians uh, should stop territorial claims. Okay, I no. No. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Uh, okay, she, she changed my mind. Is Armenian believe is genocide, um, and that's important. I will show you why it's important. Uh, but also there are other narratives, people confusing different different arguments, and I think it's interesting to clarify this issue. So. Um, this is the law. The Genocide Convention was adopted in 1948. Uh, and when, when you think, okay, what I can do, what I can do, then this convention was the result of one individual. One individual called Rafael Lemkin, who was Jew. When he was studying law in Poland, uh, he learned about the Armenian Genocide. And he was shocked and started to work on the idea. At the beginning, he, he tried to create a, a crime called barbarism. And he remembered discussing with his, his professor about how the world did not react when the Armenians were killed. And the professor explained the idea of sovereignty. Each person, I, I, my, I had chickens. I, I can kill my chicken. And for him, it was the same. And then this Rafael Lekin became obsessed with that. And when Hitler took power and started the process, he saw it coming. So he went to, his, to the house of his parents and tried to say, Look, the Nazis occupied Poland. They will attack you, they will kill you. And the parents said, No, we have nothing to do. Why? We did, we did nothing against the Germans. And of course, so he could not convince his parents to leave. So he had to, he escaped himself, leaving his parents who died, were exterminated with the genocide. And in 1944, he was living in the US and he decided to invent this crime. And he was a linguistic expert. So he found, he created this word genocide, inspired by the Armenian genocide, to apply in the Nazi genocide. And uh, <laughs> he explained, I made the decision that my mission in life will be to convince nations from all over the world to adopt the law to protect all the groups in the world. And he said, and I take the obstacles to fulfill my mission as a test of my moral strength. So that was, that was the guy. And he succeeded. He was sending some, some letters, he was mobilizing people, and then in 1948, this convention was approved. Today, there are 153 states signatories. And the, the important thing here is the convention is very unique. It has this Alpine one saying the state parties are committed to prevent and to punish. Therefore, 
That's why I insisted it's a genocide because genocide has this characteristic. Other crimes, the Geneva Convention defining war crimes is, is not saying that, and there's no treaty for the crimes against humanity. So this is the only treaty signed by states forcing them to do something. And that's why I, I was involved in this because Gassi Abkarian, she, she had the, the Center for Social Justice, were inviting me discussing, discussing this issue for the last three years. And in August, in July, some Argentinian Armenians called me, I live in Malibu, so they called me and said, Luis, can you do that? something on like that? And they showed me the case, the ICJ case, the International Court of Justice case, where Armenia was challenging Azerbaijan for for the, the arminophobia, basically, the discrimination. And in that case, I read something incredible. It was 15 judges told Azerbaijan that blocking the Lashin corridor was creating the risk for the life of the Armenian living in Nagorno-Karabakh. And if you read the Genocide Convention, I think to Z, that's exactly the crime described there. No, it's deliberately inflicting on a group condition of life calculated to bring about the its physical destruction. So what happened was when I read this decision, okay, this is a genocide, and then intention should be uh, deduced. By, by the element. That's why I, I became a friend of Judge Garcia because I was calling her. I was doing this report pro bono, so I had no team, so I had to study myself. And I was desperate to show very clearly why the intention was there because, as you see, the, the crime required the intention to destroy the group. And, uh, and then we're discussing with Garcia how, in a normal case, she's a judge in a criminal court here. So, how in a normal case you prove intention? And normally, you prove, if I put a knife in your chest. I have intention to kill you. So, intention can be deduced from the facts. In this case, Aliyev blocked the Russian corridor after the International Court of Justice, 15 judges, telling him if you, block, if you should open the Russian corridor because the blockade is creating a risk for the life of these people. So, is black and white, and this is an instruction, it's not an advice, it's an order. So, ignoring the order, challenging the order, is clearly showing the willingness he had to do that. And why the discussion with Garcia helped me to present properly in the, in the report the idea why the intention was there. And I like to say that because it's showing how I work since I retired. I ended my job as a prosecutor in 2012. And from those days, I was helping some communities, Palestinians, Syrians, Venezuelans, Colombians. But I never met a group of people like the Armenians. You have a great diaspora, incredibly, incredibly strong and active. And Tim Shamal was working on the lobbying the Congress. And a member of the, in fact, half Armenian guy advising a member of the House was calling me, telling me to his a congressman called Smith, Bill Smith, was doing was willing to do a hearing on based on my report. And Tim took advantage of that visit organized a meeting with the staff of the Council of the, 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 the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. So we went there. The, the, the hearing with the House member was great. He, he, I told him, look, we, it's interesting because we don't need to convince President Biden that genocide is wrong. He's very committed. So maybe he needs more information on the facts. So. He said, I will write a letter. Please do it. So a nice letter. So he decided to do a letter. And then in the afternoon, we met 
the staff of this committee on foreign relations. And the following day, Kim organized a meeting with Ambassador Kim, who was special advisor, special was in charge, and the secretary of the part of State, the State Department in charge. Um, it was a fascinating meeting, and really we transformed her thinking because the same day, after the Senate committee, the Senate committee invited this Ambassador Kim to go to the Senate. And the following week, she went there and she presented a new policy where the US say they were promising to protect the right of Nagorno Karabakh people. Armenia keep fighting. And then that was a, a Thursday, 14 of September. On the 18 and 19, there were one page and a half page ad in the Washington Post and the New York Times asking President Biden to stop the genocide. President Biden was talking, opening the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly on the 19. He did not talk about this issue. And we discussed why. why. And uh, the same day, Azerbaijan attacked Nagorno Karabakh and then produced a different type of genocide. Article 2B causing serious mental harm. Because imagine how affected you should be to let every, every behind you, your properties, your house, everything, and go, escape. Everyone escape. In a few days, everyone escaped from Nagorno Karabakh. And that, for me, is a great example of the genocide through mental harm. You don't need to kill, you don't need to even wound the people, it's mental harm. And I was interviewing people on that. Um, so this is this two types of genocide clearly committed today. And the issue is still states are not talking about genocide. And that's why I made the question to her. Look, Armenia should talk about genocide. Any cleansing is not genocide. Any cleansing is a poetic way to describe the problem, but has no legal implication. The legal implication is genocide should be prevented, Article 1. And that is the reason the states are not recognizing the genocide. To avoid the trigger of the responsibilities. And that's why I told Angela, Angela, we need to convince the Armenians, they should talk about genocide each day. So each Armenian community should mention it's a genocide, not ethnic cleansing, not for displacement, it's genocide. Who we also cast against humanity or persecution, but the issue is genocide requires state, 153 states, including US, Russia, France, Italy, Azerbaijan itself, to prevent genocide. So that gives us a, a leverage on the topic. And the only reason the Nagorno Karabakh Armenians could go back and stay there if, if we recognize they are victims of genocide. Because if not, if they are normal citizens of Azerbaijan, they cannot write. So the only way to protect Nagorno Karabakh is to insist it's a genocide. Okay? Any comments? Any, any objection? Or you can say, no, no, not just. <laughs> and uh, we tell you. Uh, uh, any comment on this? Because my plan is to move on to explain the second part. As you see, prevention is still a problem because. Um, the issue is why they are not recognizing. They are not stupid. State are smart people. They don't have to do it. They do an enormous effort to refuse a genocide. And why you should keep insisting. And we should produce a report clarifying this issue very even more. And the students should keep forcing this. Labeling a genocide is key for this fight to protect Nagorno Karabakh and to protect Armenia. Uh, the, 
Why genocide is not recognized? This is all history. Samantha Barber, who is today in the government, and she knows about genocide, she explained her books, two books, about this issue uh, that is a constant. In any genocide, the state, US in particular, is making an enormous effort to not talk about genocide, not to mention genocide. And that creates problems, because then you cannot prevent the problem you are not identifying. Um, today, there are three goals. One to protect Armenians from genocide. Armenians, not just in Nagorno Karabakh, as you say, as you know, Aliyev in May was talking about they had to go back to the West. Azerbaijan. So, and, and um, the president of Turkey, and now, a few weeks ago, mentioned the need to go back to the Ottoman Empire, means no Israel, no Armenia. So, the reason many is still important, but in some way, because the hearing that team organized in the Senate, the state department is committed now to do something, and they are talking about respect for Nagorno Karabakh, and they are making more pressure to protect Armenia. So today, Azerbaijan is adjusting. They are not talking more about West Armenia. They would be like, that's why we have to keep existing. But the real, today, we have to really be strong to help Nagorno Karabakh Armenians to go back to recover the rights. And more important, more urgently probably, is there are 55 Armenians in, in custody in, in Azerbaijan. And there's no judge who will protect their rights in Azerbaijan, because there is no independent judges in Azerbaijan. The US State Department made a report on 2022 saying there are no, the judges in Azerbaijan are not independent. And people in, in prison are tortured and some of them killed. So these 55 people in jail in Azerbaijan are hostages. And they are hostages because basically it's a message to the 100,000, 120,000 Azerbaijan Armenians who escaped. Don't come back. If you come back, you will be humiliated, arrested, or killed. That's why they're hostages. And that's why this is an urgency. So, Article 1 says there are two uh, duties of states. One to prevent, they fail to prevent for geopolitical reasons. For the US, Azerbaijan is an ally against Iran and, if possible, against Russia. Uh, Italy is buying gas from Azerbaijan, Israel is selling weapons. So, Ariel was understanding for geopolitical reasons he is supported. So, we have to, in order to improve this, the power of Armenia, genocide is an important barrier. And I want to keep working on genocide and prevention. But I'd like to invite Chad Garcia Karian to discuss the punishment thing. Because you are living in a country where the law here is respected. And even a policeman who killed George Floyd went to jail. The policeman went to jail. So with the law you inside the U.S. is respected, and you expect the same globally. But globally, it's different. If you remember the, the helicopter Apache shooting people in Baghdad because of like WikiLeaks, nothing happened because it was legal according to the U.S. With the U.S., soldiers from helicopter shooting civilians in Baghdad. They were thinking they, this guy was terrorist, or shooting them was okay. And the, the Iraqi people had no right to have independent judiciary, and therefore nothing happened to them. So the US applied the law inside, not so much outside. So, and I like Judge Garcia because she's applying as a judge the, the, the justice, the law here, and now he's learning this uh, much more. Uh, fragmented and complicated international legal system. Can you come?
and she will explain to you the difference between what explain to them what you see are the difference between the national criminal justice system in the US and the international <coughs> criminal justice system that you are understanding. Well, see, the, at the national level, you can actually convict someone with proof. At the international level, you can have all the proof in the world, but getting a conviction is very complicated. I think you, we should ask the prosecutor here. Okay, the part that 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 the group I'm associated with is called Center for Truth and Justice. In case you're interested, and I'm an advisor to the group, and I do a lot of teaching because the group's main purpose is we started right after the 44-day war. Um, the purpose is to collect um, evidence of war crimes. We didn't think three years later we were going to have to collect evidence of genocide because as an Armenian, a descendant of survivors of genocide, you don't ever want to hear the word genocide ever again. You think that never again is a true thing, but here we are 110 years later and, and, and our people have again gone through genocide. So the portion that the Center for Truth and Justice is focused on is collecting evidence. We've collected almost 500 testimonial evidence um, in order to, the prevention part failed. Um, Luis was involved in writing that opinion in July or August, August, August in August, saying the blockade of the Laching Corridor is, um, is genocide and therefore placing responsibility with state parties that says now your job is to prevent because here's the legal opinion that says if there's genocide then under the convention as a state party, your job is to prevent. Well, that didn't happen. And Luis, unfortunately, together with me and all Armenians, watched the conclusion of the ongoing genocide, which was the emptying of the Armenians out of Artsakh. <clears throat> so then we get to punishment. Under the convention, there's the portion of punishment. So how do we re achieve punishment? Well, first you need evidence. The evidence has been collected, not just by Center for Truth and Justice, but many other groups. The evidence has, is very well documented. The avenues for punishment are very limited on an international level. This is what I'm learning for the past three years. I've had to do a quick study and, and with Luis's support and help, <clears throat> I'm learning what has to be done. Um, those of you who don't follow this, you should. Um, the ICJ rulings and the decisions are unprecedented. Maybe you can talk about this. but. Um, the most recent provisional rulings came out, I don't know, about 10 days ago. For the first time, the International Court is now, uh, has now ordered Azerbaijan to report to the ICJ, literally report back, and their first report is due January 12 of 2024, of whether or not they're following up the IC, according to the ICJ rulings. Um, and that falls under this thing called CERD, which is racial discrimination. Um, so far, every order that the ICJ has made of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan has violated. They have not followed a single one of those rulings. So ultimately, it comes back to where Luis started his prosecutorial career, which is the International Criminal Court. And um, Armenia just became a full member of the Rome Statute. We, the, Armenia is now the 124th member, um, which means Armenia has direct jurisdiction, has jurisdiction with the ICC to bring cases. Well, the way it works is, this is how it's different. Um, the prosecutor at the ICC is the one who makes the ultimate decision of who and what cases they will investigate. It doesn't mean they will prosecute. It means that, you know, have they made the decision to investigate? So what we're all involved in right now is to get this evidence in front of the ICC with the hope and the expectation that they will open investigation against specific individuals. Obviously, the number one person we're seeking investigation is um, Aliyev himself, but it's not just him. There are commanders, there are people around him, and this is where it gets complicated. Um, you can have, from my understanding, all the evidence in the world, but ultimately the prosecutor at ICC makes the decision whether to open investigation. And that's all we're asking for. But there's cases where investigation has been open for years and years and never goes to prosecution. Am I right? Yeah, there are some cases. Two months, you did it. Depends. 
It depends. So it could be done in months or it could go sort of stale, right? So this is the stage we're in of, of now that, well, we're, we're still collecting evidence. It's endless because when 110,000 people crossed from Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh into Armenia, you know, um, most of them are not ready to talk because they're still in shock. They're trying to find homes. They're trying to survive. They're trying to find food, places to put their kids in school. There are so many families where both parents died in this last attack and assault. There are children who have no parents left, whose grandparents, there's a story where an 82 year old grandmother has four grandkids that she's now in charge of because both parents died. Um, the stories go on and on. It's very, it's, I mean, I don't want to tell you about all the evidence because it's out there. If you're interested, you can look it up. Um, all the evidence that the Center for Truth and Justice collects is completely confidential and we do not produce their actual names. Key cards are used so that we protect their identity. Um, so it's a complicated process that we've been involved. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, but, but I'm going to say something positive. It all sounds really sad. The place I get my energy from is after 1915, these international tools did not exist for us. We never went to court. We never sought prosecution. We couldn't even imagine a prosecution. We couldn't even think about collecting evidence. Um, our, our grandparents did not have that hope or expectation because that thinking didn't even exist, all right? So the positive part is, um, I was talking to some lawyers who were doing work on Armenia uh, and we were thanking them. These are non-Armenian lawyers and they said, you don't have to thank us. I said, no, I do have to thank you because our history is they kill us, they deny us, uh, the killings, and then we're forgotten. This time around, they killed us. They're still denying it, but this time we're doing something about it. Okay, so from the perspective of a, a, an Armenian community in the diaspora, I take, um, you know, a lot of energy from that. There's That's where, that's why I work um, between hours of my job. <laughs> I have a day job, but I work in the evenings and the weekends, and Lisa and I talk all the time. And there are many, many others who are involved in this process. So, um, and, and the reason this is really important for us is because Armenia is a fledgling democracy, okay? Armenia is um, a sovereignty and an independent country, but it, ha it still carries the wounds of, of Soviet imperialism. And prior to that, obviously, Ottoman. Um, and so the Republic of Armenia is just finding its tiny little wings of saying we can actually stand up for the rights of our people. Because if Armenia didn't become a member of the ICC, if Armenia did not open a case against Azerbaijan in the ICJ, we would have no avenues. Because you can't exactly come to federal court in the US and bring cases against Azerbaijan because there's no jurisdiction here. I mean, we've looked at jurisdiction, ways to open cases in federal court or state courts. It's extremely difficult. It's extremely complicated. Supreme Court in this country has basically closed the door on that. So we have to use international courts, international avenues. Um, and um, Luis, I, I, you know, I've heard Luis talk and every single time he speaks, it gives me more energy because we need non-Armenians who appreciate the law um, and appreciate how it can be used for the protection of our people. But it's a continuum. We're a part of this global insanity where people are killed en masse and yet avenues of justice are not discussed. Um, and then if, 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 if you stop discussing those avenues, then what's left? You just, you know, you go along and you sort of bury the truth. Um, you know, I have trouble watching the news. And that's a way of bearing the news a little bit, right? Oh, okay, fine. But go on. That's it. That's all I have. No, no. Yeah, okay. no. Go ahead. Say, say here. No, because he's going to ask. I in my head because in the U.S. you got judges, you got you mistake is, for instance, she is working in reviewing cases of people in jail for twenty years for no reason, no? Yes, there, there's there's things called the Innocence Project, and yes. Okay, so even you have mistake, but you can change. But also, U.S. is a good example of some cases, 
were complicated. The, the short for killing was complicated, and people were demanding justice. Investigation of President Trump are complicated, and people oppose. So the ICT is about this type of cases. ICT is similar to President Trump investigation. Complicated, people having different ideas, judges have to do the job, but it's not just about judges and prosecutors. It's about normal people demanding justice. And, and that is for me the, the point I was trying to make. You know, in the U.S., the system is settled, yes, and the judge is in charge. At the global level, there's no system. We need to invent the system. I'm sorry, Angela, that's the problem. That's why your job is, and we support you, but you, your generation, have to build the system. And the Armenian case could be the first case. You can... The Armenian cases could be the first case. Yeah, to show we won. Did you hear that? <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm going to leave that to you. Yeah, yeah. I, yes, yes. Winning is, winning is not just Aliyev in jail. Winning is protecting Armenia. Winning is trying to rescue the people, the hostages. Winning is to give them right to Nagorno-Karabakh people going back. Winning is building a strong diaspora. It's not just about court cases in court. Look, I am teaching, I am in Los Angeles because I'm teaching the USC Cinematic Art School, no more in Harvard, Cinematic School. Why am I in the Cinematic Art School? Because I learned the word Holocaust with capital letter is not the result of the Nuremberg trial. It's the result of the movie about the Nuremberg trial. So the Nuremberg trial was in the world between 1945 and 1948. The word Holocaust started to be used in 61, 62. What happened? Judgment and Nuremberg, a movie with Spencer Tracy was premiered in Berlin in December 61. And that was critical, starting. And then, in Stone, when Mary Streep made a miniseries called Holocaust, that miniseries transformed Holocaust into Stone, written Stone. So, you know just about judges, is Law is a social construction. We need to build it. And that's why my last slide is this. So we should use movies. And you should have movies now. Who of you saw watch Aurora Sunrise? Can you raise your hand, those of you who saw Aurora Sunrise? Oh my god! You did not! Okay. It's, it's on PBS. It's Aurora Sunrise is on PBS. And? and it's on PBS. And what's the problem? They can watch it. It's available. Ah, they, they can do it. Yes. They don't have to look for it. It's on TV. They can. That's why for me, it's shocking that it's shocking that you did not see it, watch it because it's an incredible movie. Uh, this real Aurora, and it, when she was young, Aurora was victim of genocide. She was raped. She was abducted. She was sold as slave. After two years, you know, she, she managed to escape. She arrived to New York. A, a journalist wrote her story. The story became a book. The book became a movie. And she was an actress in the movie. So she was acting herself. The movie was no sound. Silent. So it was a huge success. And, but the movie was destroyed and lost. So the director, for a sunrise, what she did it is it is she created she they got back 18 minutes of the movie. So she mixed the 18 minutes of the movie with like a cartoon, beautiful design, and it's a beautiful movie about what happened in 1915. And I suppose it's not that you have to watch, you have to see how to use in the schools. Your kids have to learn about this. This is a movie. And the second movie I think I'm promoting now movies. Is, is a Amerikatsi. Amerikatsi is a movie about an Armenian who was back to the Soviet Union and for a stupid reason is in jail. He's accused of cosmopolitanism, meaning he was using nice ties. And he didn't understand exactly what he accused, and he, he offered them to give ties. And he told them 10. He said, yeah, I will give you 10. And he signed. But 10 was a, a conviction for 10 years for cosmopolitanism. And he spent 10 years in, in jail in Soviet Union. 
And this movie is a minion candidate for this Oscar. And this, the Oscar, will, the 15th, the, the first selection of 15 will be done this December 16. So if you can promote that, that would be fantastic because the idea for me to, to be in the competition for the Oscar and to win the Oscar with this movie next year is not just important for Armenians, it's important for the hostages because this movie is about one Armenian hostage of the Soviet Union in the 50s and could be used to put pressure on, on, on free the current Armenian hostage. So, and those who are not lawyers, Gassi is doing criminal law, those who are not lawyers should do a lot of things. And it's about culture. And they have more ideas. Maybe you, can, you have to come and explain what more ideas. Uh, or no. <laughs> Later. Yes. So this is the this movie will be premiere will be shown on December on five in what happened? This one? on December 5 in, in the USC. Any comment on question? What, what else can you do? Because I, yes. You use the phrase, the man. Can you come uh, here? Can you come here and talk? <laughs> in your discussion, you use the phrase of demanding justice. The, the ultimate requirement for getting justice is not prosecution. The ultimate, ex uh, ultimate execution of justice is the performance of punishment, punishment that gets the other party's attention. A man was uh, driving his wife in the covered wagon in the United States going out into the West find a new life. And when the horse or the mule that was dragging the wagon began to falter, the man said, that's one. And his wife said, what is that? He said, well, you'll find out. Then he drove on, the animal got a little bit more energy and again began to falter. And he said, that's two. Well, the final occurrence of number three, the man takes out his gun and kills, kills the horse. Why did you do that? To get his attention. <laughs> now, how do, we get, how do we get attention, which is required for justice? The biggest need is execution. Nobody's going to do anything nope. unless they suffer economically and physically. We need to spend our time getting execution of justice. Well, look, in my experience, um, yes, punishment is important, but the most important thing is to understand the crime committees. Normally, when you understand the crime committees, the perpetrators became marginal and remove it. And maybe you can put them in jail. In my country, when I prosecuted generals, my mother was against me. My mother loved the generals. My mother loved General Videla. So we prosecuted generals in court, but I was telling, and you can see this in the movie, it's in Argentina 1985. I was telling my chief prosecutor, look, my mother believed we're wrong. We need to convince those who are not believing us. We need to convince those who are against us. So the fight for justice is has different dimensions. And it's not just about putting people in jail. It's basically narratives. It's a narrative thing. That's why movies are important. And I can give you examples. In my case, as the SEC prosecutor, the most interesting thing happened was a group of children, young kids, not children, kids, 25, from San Diego, there's a group called Invisible Children, and they were decided to stop Joseph Kony, who was a warlord from Uganda. And they basically did a, a they used YouTube, was new in those days, to promote a documentary called 
according to the 12, who make Colin so famous that they were a lot of effort to stop him and arrest him, and they succeeded. So the documentary got 120 million views in six days. So it's not just about people in jail. Bill Laden was killed, and terrorism is still flourishing. So it's not about bad guys in jail. It's about how you manage the information. Today, what's happening in Gaza and Israel is a huge conflict to understand exactly what's happening. Information is key. And that's why my suggestion is yes, we have to work on punishing Ariel, yes. But it's not enough. We have to do more. We have to do more, including global narrative. That's why. I believe the idea to include normal people who are not prosecutors, who can do social media or discuss movies, to do that. Because that, I saw the change. And finally, when I was prosecuted in the country, and we prosecuted the general, I would put them in jail. I was thinking we're transforming Argentina into Sweden. It's not Sweden, Argentina is chaotic. The Italian are chaotic. However, Argentina 1985 is no more Argentina. 76 to the dictatorship. Argentina changed it. No more dictatorship, no more killings. All the problems, no more killings. So you never win. You never win. You lose when you stop fighting. You lose when you stop fighting. And the day you stop fighting, you lose. When you continue fighting, the fight continues. The battle continues. That's why. An Armenian had this resilience. I found fascinating to see Armenian generation and generation fighting. I, I met an Armenian lady in Paris who was people of UNPR. She said to me, Oh my God. She, she said, My boss says it's impossible. I'm Armenian. For me, Kai is the limit. That is attitude. So I think that is what you have to do. And the idea to reinforce each other is what we should do. Keep fighting. We keep fighting, and we found all the evidence long ago. Yes, we did anything. It, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, you, and you're not getting my message. It's not just about evidence. It's about, you believe the Trump cases are about evidence? No, it's not about the evidence. The Trump followers don't, don't care about the evidence. They don't believe in the evidence. So the, even the judge conviction will not be enough. So it's not about evidence, it's about how the community discusses the problem, how the community feels. That is, for me, my point. Any other comment? Can you come in? I think we get more fighting, fighting back. So we started the war first with the world about trying to get the lands and grab them, but the result was 30 years later they took revenge for the fight we started. Instead of using the law back in 1990 and saying, okay, Soviet Union is gone, why don't we reconsider the land that the Soviets had chopped up? and go back to what it was before the Soviet Union, since they no longer exist, they no longer have the power to decide. Uh, why didn't we start then legally solving the problem instead of sending the army in and saying this is ours? Well, people, the, too late now, but... No, I think you're right in the sense but you're saying fighting, and then there was no. I don't say fighting. I don't say fighting with war. I'm fighting legally. I don't. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't mention fighting with weapons. I. I strongly believe in the law. They will fight back, saying no, we didn't have the law. No, no. I will rephrase my my wording was wrong. When I say fighting, it's not fighting with war. I think hmm, pushing our arguments, presenting our ideas, being firm in our principles. That's the that fight I'm proposing, not fighting with weapons. People who are doing in power, they believe normally land acquisition is normally by war, but there are different cases. Uh, Iceland became independent from Denmark through legally, not any zero fight. So there are cases with 
independence was got without fight. It's a pity that Armenia did not solve the issue in Nagorno Karabakh in 2000, 2010. That would be the moment they should. Now it's much more complicated. That's why, yes. But I think Nagorno Karabakh is not fighting with weapons, so it's, it's a legal battle. And that's why the case in the National Court of Justice, YCC, are relevant. That's why the, the discussion we're proposing is legal, but also in particular communication. Communication is our battle. And why Angela, Twitter and TikTok are so important. Yes. Um, thank you for uh, coming here, and uh, you follow you uh, quite a bit on YouTube also. Um, um, I have a I have a I have quite a few questions, but uh, Garcia. Uh, already answered my question in a, sense of, in a sense of bringing more optimistic uh, point of view and uh, your uh, point of view in a sense of in today's environment uh, community and people will make a difference much more difference than it used to be before because I was thinking um, but that's a kind of a because we always want to get a result right now we want to we want to have a yes. push we want yes. a result right at this moment yes but apparently that's not the point in the sense of if you look at the uh, situation in israel and uh, uh palestine at this moment uh we see a huge tragedy yes. on the other hand you look at the uh, the reaction in the world that never happened before I think the information era that we're living right now, it makes a lot of difference. Yeah. And, uh, but that's a kind of a slow step. One question I'd like to ask you, um, if the um, uh, outside population didn't leave, stayed a little bit longer, do you think the situation would have been a lot different because the world almost getting a little bit more, uh, uh, they were reacting much, much uh, uh, stronger. Yeah. No, because, would be, no, because the people in Neono Karabakh will be arrested and they will be saying, oh, there are charges. So it will not be, after they control, Azerbaijan will not do massive killing. They will do arrest, what they did, humiliation. So on the contrary, it would be painful. I think. The, the exodus presented it very clearly, black and white, it's a genocide. So I think, and also, I had a couple of friends there, I was really worried, and I'm very happy that they escaped. So I think it's bad, but they, I hope they can come back, and we can do, help them come back. But I think escaping was the right thing. But how do we convince the uh, government to accept this was a genocide when you just uh, a while ago we, we talked about uh, the United States knowingly that was a genocide. They're not saying it's genocide. Well, 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 a, we, we have to go, it's a battle, but now they open, now they recognize in the last in, in hearings in the Congress, uh, O'Brien, who represents Ambassador Kim, is saying they're conducting an assessment. And so now we understand they cannot. So, and there are new reports coming, and I think it's a matter to keep keep doing that. That's why, that's why the moment with Armenia should push, not keep quiet. You should push. I would do something more, but and I invite the next week to the UN Commission uh, Human Rights Commission. So the activities we should push, push, push. That is that. That's what I was telling him. If you stop doing, you lost. Thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I, I, my question is about this point that you brought up that I guess Rabbi Lemkin talked about, which is sovereignty. And sovereignty is, still remains a, a big problem because in the UN Charter, there are very limited means by which a nation can invade another nation. So the UN Convention on Genocide and a stipulation for prevention and punishment, like it 
I'm not a legal scholar, so it, how would it be that any nation or group of nations can undertake prevention and punishment? What are the mechanisms now, and what are the mechanisms that should be? No, that's not the point. The, you don't need to invent the country to do prevention. If you stop Israel selling weapons to Azerbaijan, there's no war, there's no threat. Azerbaijan without Iran weapons and without Italy money cannot affect Armenia. So it's not just about, that's why the, the battle is not just through armies. The real battle is economic, geopolitical, and communication. That's the battle. But we have this war where the US is supporting Azerbaijan to attack Iran, because Iran could attack Israel, but Israel is giving weapons to Azerbaijan. So that's the geopolitical situation we have. And that's why a world organized through geopolitical interest has no future. It's Fortnite. You know Fortnite, the game? In Fortnite, 100 players, the winner is the one who kills all the others. And that is a strategy in geopolitical terms. That's a horrible idea. So I think that's why Armenia and Gaza Israel and what happened today is giving us the possibility to change that. That's why Armenia saw it such an important case, not just for Armenia, for the world. But it's not, so protecting is not about, it's not about armies, it's about impose law limit geopolitics. That's it. In the same way, domestically in the US, normally law impose political interests, sometimes not. This you have to start. Answer that. Um, my quick question is that uh, given that you believe this is a genocide, Sorry? given that you believe that this is a genocide, and um, given that uh, given how unequal the power is between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and how some narratives have been that Armenia must negotiate with Azerbaijan, do you think Armenia is even positioned to negotiate with Azerbaijan? Well, Armenia negotiated with Azerbaijan. In some way, influenced by U.S. and European Union, but in particular by U.S., Armenia gave up on Nagorno-Karabakh. And when, when the Ru Russians say, we're not protecting Nagorno-Karabakh because Armenia say it's part of Azerbaijan. If Nagorno-Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan, we have nothing to do. So Armenia negotiated that. Armenia is hoping that U.S. and Europe will protect it. And it's happening. Maybe, Tim, Tim, you'd like to expand more on protection of Armenia today? What's the risk for Armenia? But, uh, but uh, if you like. Um, the, I believe in the geopolitical game, Armenia now is more protected than Nagorno Karabakh. And yes, Armenia is negotiating. But the negotiation is about um, commercial roads. So that was today, US is demanding, and Azerbaijan is saying. Two months ago, it was different. So, yes, it's a negotiation. Tim, I don't know if Tim wants to expand. No, Tim is exhausted. Oh. <laughs> you have a question? Um, first of all, I want to thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to um, ask, uh, ever since 1994, after the end of the first uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war, um, for the last 30 years, there was no like uh, attention from the international community. Um, however, after the Armenians uh, fled Nagorno Karabakh, there have been two um, observer missions by the UN. Um, I just wanted to ask: Did those two observer missions maybe change the perspective of like how the international world is seeing the situation and the issue? And would that um, observer missions change the? Um, Future of how the ICC or ICJ or the European Court would um, approach this issue and possibly um, bring um, to justice the Aliyev regime. Is it possible? I, I don't know the second mission. I know the first mission. The first mission is highly criticized because they say they we have found no Armenian here. Yes, they escape. So and you know UN is fragmented. UN. Whatever they say is not important for other areas. Uh, the, ba the basic big failure was the U.S. Security Council in was at the end of August 
uh, yeah, I didn't know I was ignoring the genocide. I would, that was a green light for Aliyev. Uh, now things are changing. They are not talking about genocide, but now doing research and recognizing this uh, ethnic cleansing. Nothing defined yet. And yes, if Azerbaijan make a deal, commercial deal with Armenia, they will try to say, okay, nothing happened. When I was a prosecutor, they were telling me, don't do a criminal case now because we are trying to negotiate them. And, and if, they, if, you, if they do a negotiation, say, don't do a, a criminal case now because we did the negotiation. So the, the tension between geopolitical and justice are permanent. And that's why you need to put that different with national cases. And that's what you should do. The human reports are nothing just some people saying something that is not relevant for the country, not relevant for the for the US policy, for the European Union policy. But really what you see, the states are defined by economic interests. Uh, and basically that's not in Europe, because in Europe when you see Europe is saying was talking about the need of energy from Azerbaijan. Do you know how big is the import of gas from Azerbaijan to Europe? 2.7%. 2.7%. It's nothing. However, it's important in Italy. For Italy, it's 20%. So basically, Italy and Hungary are moving Europe. But now, the commissioner is under fire because she was saying Aliyev was a trustworthy partner. Now, she's backpedaling. So, there are different political games there. But making strong the chance of case will force others to recognize the limits. I don't know how far we go, but that's our fight. What, what, what work are you with no fight? Because fight, I don't like you thinking I'm proposing soldier. What word should be used against fight? Uh, peace, how about peace? Yeah, how to, how to fight for peace? Yeah. Fight for peace. Yeah. Through law. You're not helping me with it. Uh, hello. Uh, you brought up Coney in 2012. And, yeah. Uh, as somebody who was nine years old in uh, 2012, uh, I can say that the only thing I really remember from Coney 2012 was uh, the, uh, the actions of uh, the organizer of Invisible uh, Children. I think his name was James Russell. Uh, yes. Where all he, where uh, the American media portrayed him as a lunatic and a uh, fraud. There's, Something about I don't, I don't remember him going out in public naked after a few months of breakdown, unfortunately. Uh, my question is what did Coney 2012 practically uh, accomplish in prosecuting Joseph Coney other than, other than just getting his name out there? Well, um, in this with children, we were created by three young persons from. Los Angeles, two of them studying USC cinematic art school. They were, go they were evangelists. They were going to South Sudan. They passed through Gulu, north of Uganda. They saw the, what they call night commuters, children walking at night to, live, to sleep together in big places, in, in squares and, and, and big stores, because Joseph Coney and his group were attacking and, and abducting them. And these kids start to get to the US. They decided to help these people. And they did a movie about them and the kids. And they came here and they showed the movie and nothing happened. So they decided to keep insisting and try to do each year a movie and show it in schools. And they created community. And when I, after I indicted, Joseph Coney was my first indictee. And then they, Joseph Coney, when I indict him, he said, peace, I want peace. So all these people were against me because I was doing justice against someone who wanted peace. So the, the Invisible Children people were trying to do a movie showing the peace process and exposing me as a stupid prosecutor, destroying the peace process. And uh, they filmed me. And I accepted that because they, my people told me, look, these people are against us, fine. I'm a public servant, do it. I was interviewed and I told them, look, it would be painful. John Connie will not sign 
and will make attack again will be painful. So they keep filming the pit process and it failed and they, they were very depressed in the jungle waiting for Joseph Cohen to come to sign, never appear. And they decided Campbell Wright would do promote arresting Cohen. And they started to work with me and they started to promote the arrest. And they did Joseph, they did this according to the 12th movie. That was ballistic, 120 million viewers in six days. Example of happened. BBC journalist called me, called my office, saying, can't the possibility of interview because we like to promote this movie, but our editor say it's not relevant. The following day, they called me and said, don't worry about the prosecutor, we don't need him. The editor went back to his house, and his 12-year-old boy was talking all dinner about going to the 12th. So the kids were influenced in the files. And basically, this massive audience made had two impact. Many young diplomats and young people around the world was pushing for Joseph Kony, but there were also backlash. When you have 120 million viewers, one million was against you. And one million against you are a lot of people against you. Jason, the director, was evangelist. He was completely convinced he was right. When someone sent emails to invisible children saying something is wrong in invisible children, he asked send email to me, I will answer. He sent back email explaining what they did. If the people don't understand, he called by phone. The people criticizing them. He cannot support criticism. Someone keep talking bad about them, he called. Twice, he took a plane to go to ring the bell of the person who was against them and to explain personally what they were doing. This guy, imagine the mentality, thinking he was perfect guy, suddenly had one million people, or 120, one million people insulting him, and some media insulting him. And then he did not sleep for nine days, and he became nuts, and he was running naked in, in San Diego. And that is the movie you saw. But in the meantime, even he, he died in the effort. <laughs> the, no, he did not die, he, he was exposed in the effort, his movie, 190 million viewers, changed the world. Changed. So, Joseph Kony became marginal. The, the U.S. Army, the, U, the President Obama sent troops to help the African Republic to chase Kony, and the, the, the group was dismantled and disappeared. One, even one of the commanders were arrested, and Joseph Kony is the only one still escaping. But the, the movie really transformed the game. But with that, with this, uh, with the consequence you saw, the guy, the guy who did the movie became exposed as a crazy nuts guy. So yes, you have to be careful. You're doing campaigning for Armenia, do it in a way you, you can sleep. Be careful not to, not to run naked, okay? All right. Um, I want to take this opportunity before uh, we thank uh, um, Mr. Ocampo that you go and have some donuts and coffee before you leave. Uh, before you do that, please give him a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. And your last name? Oh, honey. Ah, you're a minion. I am.